Okay, we're on day three now, working with variables and constants. Programs need a way to store the data they use or create so it can be used later in the program's execution. Variables and constants offer various ways to represent, store, and manipulate that data. So we're going to learn how to declare and define variables and constants, how to assign variables to values and manipulate those values, how to write the value of a variable to the screen. What is a variable? A well, in C++, a variable is a place to store information. A variable is a location in your computer's memory in which you can store value and from which you can later retrieve that value. So notice that variables are used in temporary storage. When you exit a program or turn the computer off, information in the variable is lost. Permanent storage, different matter. Typically the values from variables are permanently stored either in a database or to a file on a disk. Storing to a file on a disk is discussed in day 916, advanced inheritance. So storing data in memory. Your computer's memory can be viewed as a series of cubby holes. Each cubby hole is one of many, many such holes all lined up. Each cubby hole or memory location is numbered sequentially. These numbers are known as memory addresses. A variable reserves one of these cubby holes in which you could store a value. Your variable's name, for example my variable, is a label on one of these cubby holes so that you can find it easily without knowing its actual memory address. This is a figure of this idea. As you can see from the figure, my variable starts at memory address 103. Depending on the size of my variable, it could take one or many more memory addresses. RAM stands for random access memory. When you run your program, it is stored and loaded into RAM from the disk file. All variables are created in RAM. When a programmer talks about memory, it is usually RAM to which they are referring. Setting aside memory, when you define a variable in C++, you must tell the compiler what kind of variable it is. This is usually referred to as the variable's type, integer, a floating number, character, and so forth. This information tells the compiler how much room to set aside and what kind of value you want to store in your variable. It also allows the compiler to warn you or produce an error message if you accidentally attempt to store value in the wrong type in your variable. It's called strong type. Each cubby hole one byte in size. The type of variable you create is four bytes in size and needs four bytes of memory or four cubby holes. Type of variable, for example, integer, tells the compiler how much memory, how many cubby holes to set aside for the variable. There was a time when it was imperative that programmers understood bits and bytes. After all, these are fundamental units of storage. Computer programs have gotten better at abstracting away these details, but it is still useful how much data is stored. A quick review. Go to the appendix. Size of an integer. Any one computer, each variable type takes up a single unchanging amount of room. That is, an integer takes two bytes on one machine and four on another. But on either computer, it is always the same day in and day out. Single characters, including letters, numbers, and symbols, are stored in a variable of the type char, which is a character. Char variable is most often one byte long. Someone says char, la la. For smaller integer numbers, a variable can be rated using the short type. Short type integer is two bytes on most computers. A long integer is usually four bytes. And an integer without the keyword short or long is usually two or four bytes. Using the programming language would specify the exact size of each of its types should be however C++ does it. All it says is that a short must be less than or equal to the size of an int, which in turn must be less than and equal to the size of a long. Okay, that said, you're probably working on a computer with a two byte short and a four byte with a four byte long. Size of an integer determined by the processor 16 bit, 32 bit, or 64 bit, and the compiler you use. On a 32 bit computer with an Intel Pentium processor using modern compilers, integers are four bytes. When you create a program, you should never assume the amount of memory that is being used for any particular type. So, compile and run these this code and tell the exact size of each type on your computer. So I'm going to do that. It probably varies for each machine. So let's just do that. I'm going to open up hello world again. Maybe I should save the code. You guys could type it up. It doesn't matter. So instead of doing this now, we're going to print out the size of each every single one of these values. Easy. All right. So all you have to do is see how the size okay. of an integer is slash t slash t which is a tab and i'm going to print size of an integer size of the method size of basically just tells you okay this is the size of an integer pass in the value of the type tells you the size of it um uh, let's see the size of a short int is slash slash t we need slash t slash t is the i told you already it's tab I'm just gonna have tab twice size of short oh uh, let's put bytes out what is it short long char float double bool okay okay um so we're gonna do this and we're just going to copy and paste uh, let me delete this i'm gonna copy this print the size of an int <clears throat> next one is a long 
print the size of a long size of long we use the size of a method basically size of char size of float size of double size of bool char float char float double bool double it's not an int and boolean boolean is basically true and false okay so basically integer is an integer short is a smaller version of an int long is a longer version of an int when i say shorter version i meant like fewer decimal places it could store char is a character the, basically the data type of a character float is basically float is basically a uh we talked about that basically decimal values double is a you could have a longer you could store more decimal values the larger storage for float boolean is boolean Mm, represents true and false. Excuse me for a second. So let's just run this. I clicked run. Size of an int is four bytes. Size of a short int is two. Size of a long int is four. Oh, but that's weird. Size of a ch float, ch size of a char, which is a character, is one byte. Size of a float is four. Size of a double is eight. Size of a boolean is one. Okay, that makes sense. Let's see what they got. Four, two. Oh yeah, damn. About the same. It's exactly the same. All right. Now that we know all the the size of the data types, we could start writing our own code for the of the data type, each of the variables, basically. So there are actually two type of integers, sign and unsigned. So basically, sometimes you don't need to have negative numbers. You sometimes don't need it because like it's just a waste of space if you're never going to use a negative number. Any integer without the word unsigned is assumed to be signed. Signed uh, integers can be negative or positive. Unsigned integers are always positive. So integers, whether signed or unsigned, are stored in the same amount of space because of the this part of the storage room for a signed integer must be used to hold information on whether the number is negative or positive. The result is that the largest number you can store in an unsigned integer, twice as large as the po largest positive number you can store in a signed integer. Okay, so the largest number you can store in an unsigned integer is twice as big as the largest positive number you can store in a signed. For example, if a short integer is stored in two bytes, then an unsigned short integer can be handled from 0 to 65,535. Un alternatively, for a signed short, half of the numbers that can be stored are negative. Thus, a signed short can only represent positive numbers up to 32,767. The signed short can, all, however, represent negative numbers, giving it a range, total range is negative 32,768 to 32,767. For more information about the precedence, read this. Fundamental to variable types. Several variable types are built in C++. They can be conveniently divided into integer variable type variables, floating point type variables, which is float and double, and character variables. Floating point variables have values that can be expressed as fractions so we already talked about that they have decimal values that is they are real numbers character variables hold a single byte and are generally used for holding the three 256 characters and symbols of ascii so these are basically just random characters such as the characters on your keyboard but they're basically only one character for ever, uh, one character long so an extended ascii character anyway, defining a variable up to this point you have seen a number of variables created and used now it is time to create your own so you can create your or define a variable by stating its type followed by one or more spaces followed by the variable name and a semicolon. The variable name can be virtually any combination of the letters, but it cannot contain spaces. Legal legal variable names include X, J, R, whatever, my name, my age. Good variable names tell you what the variables are for. Using good names makes it easier for the, to understand the flow of your program. So use good variable names. The following statement defines my an integer variable called my age. So int my age. When you declare a variable of memory is allocated set aside for that variable the value of the variable will be however whatever happened to be in that memory at that time you will see in a moment how to assign a new value to that memory as a general programming practice avoid such horrific names such as jrq square root nf and restrict single letter variable names such as x and i to variables that are only used very very briefly try to use expressive names such as my age or and how many such names are easier to understand and three weeks later when you're scratching your head trying to figure out what you meant when you wrote that line of code so experiment guess what these programs do based on the first few lines okay so in short x in short y in short z they said z equals x times y okay so that just returns x times y but you can't you can't really guess anything of this because they use horrible variable names. But look at this, unsigned short width, unsigned short length, unsigned short area, area equals width times length. This is easier to understand because now you know that it's probably a program that calculates the area of a rectangle. Whereas here you just know that it just multiplies them. So that could mean anything. So that's why I use good variable names. Clearly the purpose of the second program is easier to guess, and the, and the inconvenience of having to type the longer variable names is more than made up for by how much easier it is to understand and thus maintain and the second program. Case sensitivity. C++ is case sensitive. In other words, uppercase and lowercase are considered to be different. So a variable name age is different from the variable name uppercase age, which is different from 
all caps age. Some compilers allow you to turn cap sensitivity off, but don't be tempted to do this because your programs won't work with other compilers and, and other C++ programmers will be very confused by your code. So naming conventions. Variable naming conventions exist for how to name variables, and although it doesn't match, it doesn't matter which method you adapt, it is important to be consistent throughout your program. Inconsistent naming will confuse other programs when they read your code. So many programmers prefer to use all lowercase letters, remember all lowercase letters for their variable names, if the name requires two words, for example, my car, two pop popular conventions are used. You use underscore, or you use this thing called camel case. This is a type called camel notation because the capitalization looks different like a camel's bump. So basically, you use my underscore car, or you could use camel case, where you capitalize the second letter, the first letter of the second word. So my car, it capitalizes the first letter of the second word, my, and the C is capitalized in car. Some people find the underscore to be easier to read, but others prefer avoid the underscore because it's much more difficult to type. This book uses camel case notation in which all the second letters for are capitalized, so the quick box, so forth. Many advanced programmers would adopt notation such as Hungarian notation. What the heck is that? The idea behind Hungarian notation is to prefix every variable with a set of characters and describe its type. What? Integer variables might begin with the lowercase i variables of type long might became a lowercase l other notations indicate different constructs within c++ which we will learn later such as constants globals pointers and so forth it is called hungarian notation because the man who invented it charles simul of microsoft is hungarian you can find this in this thing i'm actually curious what that is but i don't know Microsoft have moved away Hungarian notation and the design recommendation for C-sharp is not to use Hungarian notation. The reasoning for C++ my C-sharp applies as well as for C++. Keywords. Some keywords are, are reserved by C++ so you cannot use them as variable names. These keywords have specific meaning to C++ compiler. Keys such as if, while, for, and main. These are keywords defined by C++ and is in this gigantic table. So you guys could look at this. Uh, you could just look at that up. Just don't just never use variables like case, catch, char, class, const, continue, default, if, else. Just don't do that. Which is not good anyway. Creating more than one variable at a time. You can create more than one variable at a time in one sentence by writing the type and then the variable name separated by a comma. So I actually had this problem earlier. Unsigned int my age, comma, my weight, long int area, comma, with comma length that creates three values of long int <clears throat> and this creates two values of unsigned int as you can see these are all declared unsigned int variables the second line occurs unsigned long variable uh, lo long integer variables and long replies to all these things assigning values to your variables you can assign a variable to a value by using the equal sign assignment operator thus you would assign five to the width by writing unsigned short width width equals to five so that's easy um long as a shorthand as long as a, you can combine the steps of creating a variable and assigning a value to it for example you could combine these steps by writing unsigned short width equals five the initialization looks very different like the earlier assignment and when using integer variables like width the difference is minor however later when const is covered you will see that some variables must be initialized because they cannot be assigned a value at a later time just as you can define more than one variable at a time you can initialize more than one variable at a time for example the following creates two variables of type long initialize them long width equals five comma length equals seven this creates two long long variables and they set them one to be equal to five one to equal seven and they have the the name width and length correspondingly this example initializes the long integer variable width to have value 5 and long integer variable length to have value 7 you can mix these uh, definitions and initializations easy wait but the second one is not initialized this shows a program ready compile that computes the error rectangle and writes it out to the screen so let's type that up really quickly I'm gonna open up Visual Studio Guys, always type up code. You learn more code by typing up more code. Okay, so this this was the time when we computed all this stuff, but now we're just gonna do this. Okay, so they have unsigned short int width equals five. So they initialized the 
first unsigned value to a five, but then they have length, so they don't want to initialize the second one. Then they set length equals to 10. Okay, that's really weird, but it's actually better if you just put length length equal 10 over here. But who am I to kid? Okay, okay create an unsigned short and initialize, initialize with results of multiplying with by length. Okay, so then unsigned short int area equals width times length. All right, that's easy. Okay, then we do see yeah. out with with and L length. We're gonna print length and then print the length and then print a new line area. area new line that returns zero save it and then this should just return five times ten I think you should print out five print out ten print then print out them multiply by each other yep five ten area fifty let's go back here as you've seen in the previous listing line two includes the required Include statement for the iOS library, so that's yeah, we're okay. We already know this. Type def creating aliases. It can become tedious and repetitive and almost important error prone by writing unsigned short int. They can uh, C enables you to create an alias for this phrase by using the type type def. This stands for type definition. In affecting, basically, you're creating a synonym, and you could basically replace the value u short. For e so every time there is an unsigned short int, it basically replaces it, creates a new name, u short, so that you could use it anywhere you have written unsigned short int. So basically, if you don't want to type unsigned short int over and over again, you could create an alias called type def unsigned short int u short, and then use u short every time. And then basically the compiler would replace u short with unsigned short int. I, I don't like this, but whatever. Using the type, you sure know. Okay, so let's just do that right now. So instead of doing unsigned short int, we're going to create a type def above main, so then it's global, so then the whole program can use it. Unsigned short int u short. Now we could remove this. We don't need this. And we just replace it with a u short. Save it and U short. Uh, we don't need this anymore. Just create U short. We create an alias to U short. <laughs> so now it's gonna compiler is gonna replace every time you have a U short with unsigned short int, so you don't have to keep typing unsigned short int over and over again. Ah, uh, oh my God! Type as a synonym. This is very much. When to use short and when to use long. One of the Source of confusion for new C++ programmers is when to declare a variable to be type long or when to declare it to be type short. The rule when understood is fairly straightforward. If any chance exists that the ver that the value you'll want to put into your variable will be too big for its type, use a longer larger type. Well, that's that's pretty much easy. The maximum value is whatever. So if the value is too big, just use long. Replace the value with long. Wrapping around an unsigned integer. That unsigned long integers have to be a limit that can hold rarely a problem. What happens if you run out of room? Ooh, when unsigned long integer reaches the maximum value, it wraps around and starts over, such as a card meter, chi odometer. It shows what happens when you stuff a value too large into a short integer. It goes back to zero. Look at that. Okay. This is declare unsigned short int, which on the Continuum of Windows XP is two bytes we're able to hold it. Then it goes back to zero if you if it's too large. Once it incremented, thus the value would become mm, grabbing around. A sign integer is different from unsigned integer. In the half of the values you can represent are negative. Instead of picturing a traditional car odometer, you might picture a clock moving like the one in this figure, in which the numbers count upward moving clockwise and downward moving counterclockwise. They cross at the bottom of the, uh, the six o'clock. 
basically this is saying when you run out of deposit numbers run into the largest you it might go back and run into the lar largest low negative numbers and then come back down to zero it shows what happens when you add one to the maximum positive number okay so we're gonna type this code up this is what happens when you run out of space for an unsigned long short whatever um, yeah I'm de deleting that alias type def short and small number and we said small number is equal to three two seven six seven I'm gonna print small number print out small number print a new line we're gonna add one plus plus means add one small number small number we're gonna print it again then we're gonna add one again add one to itself then we're gonna print it again so this is supposed to go past its storage capacity let's run it so when you add it when it go past its storage capacity it goes back to the largest negative value then when you add it again it increments up again so it's one it's the second largest negative value <sighs> okay so that's basically what it does mm, okay working with characters okay so the characters are basically just any character pretty much in the ASCII characters and numbers numbers can also be characters by the way so you could have like the character zero is different from the character and then the number zero like if you do int x equals to zero that's different from char character char x equals to quote zero so look at this when you put a number into a char value what really is there is a number between zero and 255 the compiler knows however how to translate back and forth between characters represented by a single quotation mark and then a letter num numeral or punctuation mark followed by a closing single quotation mark and the corresponding ASCII values the, the value or letter relationship is arbitrary there is no particular reason that the lowercase a is assigned to the value 97 as long as everyone in your keyboard screen agrees no problem occurs it is important to realize however that a big difference exists between the value 5 and the character 5 so yeah printing characters based on numbers lord have mercy okay I'll do that okay basically I'm going to print a number between 32 loop print a number 32 to 128 and it's going to basically have all these garbage character numbers prints the character values for the integer 32 to 127 okay wh why don't we do that this thing is called a for loop by the way basically it says for we start at a variable i, I say create an i, I called, called 32 we say while it's less than 128 we're gonna keep incrementing i we're gonna keep incrementing i but every time before we increment i we're going to print we're going to print the character equivalent of i then we're going to return zero this is basically just going to print a bunch of like the character equivalent of all these values of i look at that okay yeah it's just all the ascii values of i we print the character equivalent so 32 the integer value 32 is different from the character value 32. The character value 32 is, I think, this exclamation mark. I don't know. Yeah, that's basically it. Uh, simple program. Okay, this is a different unsigned character. This listing uses an integer value one to accomplish this cast on uh, the force of character value could also have been used in line thirty seven which has the same output. Okay, so if it's unsigned character, as you can see unsigned character because a character value is being used instead of a numeric one to see how 
no line five knows to display the character value. Okay, we we could we could do that also, because it knows it. It's the, I think it's the same. You could do the same thing as unsigned char, because it, it knows it's a character value. If I do unsigned char, it knows it's a character value, so I don't need to cast this. I don't need to like basically display it as the character value, and it's the same thing. Okay. Um, printing special characters you compile knows this. This is the most common one you could put into your code by putting a backslash called escape character. So these are the things that I told you about before. Slash T is basically um, printing a new tab, but you could also put that into a character. So when they had character, tab character, and they put that into the character, it's basically like it, it, the compiler understands special, special characters for formatting. So that's basically it. Um, these are all the escape characters. Slash A is alert. It would actually display an uh, alert in your thing. Like it would have a bell. Backspace. Slash B is backspace. Slash F is form feed. Slash N is new line. We used that before. Slash R is carriage return. Slash T is tab. Slash V is vertical tab. Uh, I'm curious what these are. And slash t uh, single uh, slash quote is single quote. <sighs> constants like variables constants are data storage locations but unlike them you you can't change them they remain constant once you initialize a constant when you create it you cannot assign a new letter value so let's say you have C++ has two types of constants literal and symbolic so literal constants is a value you type directly into your program whenever it's needed so int my age is equal to 39 my age is a variable of type int 39 is a literal constant, so this is something you literally type in. You can't assign a value to 39, and its value can't be changed. So you can't do 39 equals to, I don't know, to 100. You can't do that. Symbolic constants. A symbolic constant is a constant that is represented by a name, just as a variable is represented. Unlike a variable, however, after a constant is initialized, this, its value can't be changed. If your program has an integer variable named students and another named classes, you could compute how many students you have given a number of classes if you knew each class consists of 15 students. So basically, you say students equals classes times 15. Basically, you're computing the number of students per in every class, basically. And if you know there's 15 students in every class, you could always do classes times 15. 15 is a literal constant. Your code would be easier to read if you substitute a symbolic constant for this value. So classes times students per class. Basically, you could do this. You could define the constant students per class without having to make a change every time you use that value. So basically, we could permanently say the number of students per class is equal to 15. That means no one could change the value of 15 unless we change the, uh, the first value of it to 15. Like, you can't change the value after you declare it as 15. If you decide the number of students, you could do so if you define the class students per class without having to make a change every time you use that value. Two ways to exist to declare a symbolic constant in C++, the old traditional way is obsolete with the preprocessor directive hashtag to find the second appropriate way is to use a const. Defining constants with hashtag define. Okay, so because the number of existing programs use preprocessor hashtag define, it is important to understand how it is being used. To define a constant in this obsolete manner, you would type the you would enter this hashtag define students per class 15. Note that students per class is of no particular type in char and so on. The preprocessor does a simple text substitution. In this case, every time the preprocessor sees the word students per class, it would put in the text 15. This is basically the same thing that, that we did with type def with unsigned int a short, I think. We created something called u short using type def, so then every time the compiler sees it, it's going to replace u short with unsigned int. This is the same thing basically. Every time the compiler sees students per class, it replaces the value with 15. Defining constants with const. This is the way you should do it. Although this works, the better way is you use constants in C. Const unsigned short and students per class 15. This, this basically creates a constant called students per class, and you set the initial the value to 15. Once you set it equal to 15, you cannot change this constant value. This example declares a symbolic constant in st students per class 15. But this time, students per class is a type unsigned short int. Advantages has many, it makes your code easier to use and it prevents bugs. The biggest difference is that this 
constant has a type, and the compiler can enforce that for its type. Enumerated constants. Enumerated constants enables you to create a new type and then define that variable of those type whose values are restricted to a set of possible values. So basically, you could create your own type called color to be an enumeration. Then you could define five values for it. The color could be red, blue, green, white, and black. The syntax for creating enumerated types is write enum followed by the name of the new type braces and then closing braces separated each separated by a comma and then a semicolon basically this statement performs two tasks it makes the color which is in the enumeration to be a new type so now whenever you use color this is a, your own type then it makes red a symbolic constant with the value zero so basically how many you have like whatever you type here now has designated values zero one two three four that's what it does and so forth basically these create symbolic constants so that whatever value you substitute for like let's say red it's gonna substitute with the value zero it always starts with zero and it goes to one two three four whatever so this is what happens when you create enums every enumerated constant has an integer value if you don't specify it the first constant has a value zero and the rest counts up there any of the constants can be initialized with a particular value however and then those that are not initialized count upward from the ones before them. So if you write red equals 100, the next one would be 101. Blue would be 101. Then if you write green is equal to 500, white it will be 501. Then black equals to 700. So it doesn't. So if you specify what you want it to be, it basically overrides what I said previously about red being zero. If you set red equals 100, red is now equal to 100. Then the next one would be 101 blue would be 101 but if you set blue equal to something else it would set blue equal to that value basically this creates symbolic constants for you so you could do whatever you want with red blue green white or black it basically allows you to create your own def uh, type definition you can define variables of type color but they can be assigned only one of the enumerated values in this case red blue green white or black you can assign any color around you want to your color var va variable it is important to realize that the enumerated var variables are generally of type unsigned int and that enum constants equate to integer value variables. It is, however, very convenient to be able to name these values when working with information such as colors, days of the week, similar sets of values. This represents a program that would use enumerated type. Okay, so let's type this up. How much stuff do we have to do more? Okay, well, we're basically almost over. I just typed this up. This is an example for enumeration. <coughs> Enum days Sunday. So we didn't specify it. So Sunday, Sunday would be one. Monday would be no. Sunday would be zero. Monday would be one. Then we do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Once we do all that, we create. Let's create our enum type days, which is today. We set today equal to Monday, which really is one, because zero one, Monday is one. Sunday started zero, and then Monday is one. If you put your cursor, it even says that. Okay, so Monday is one. So today is equal to Monday, which is the value one. Create if statement. Today, if today is Sunday, or today is Saturday, we're gonna print out it's the weekend. Gotta love weekends. Otherwise, back to work. Basically, because today is Monday, which is the value one, it's not gonna be Sunday or Saturday, which is the value zero and the value six. So it's gonna print back to work. I just see what it does. Back to work, yeah. That's what it does. Basically, these are just integer values. Sunday has 0, 1. Monday has 1. Tuesday has 2. Wednesday has 3. Thursday has 4. Friday has 5. Saturday has 6. We created a value, uh, days, which is a type days, today. We set that value to be Monday, which is just 1. These are, it's basically just an integer value. Okay, so I already explained that. 
We could use constant integers. Oh, damn. So another way you could do this, we don't have to create enums, which is enumerated type. We could create constant integers Sunday equals zero. I don't want to type all this. Whatever. And equal to one. You could see how awful this is. That's why it's easier to use um, enumerated types. Thursday is equal to four. Correct. Basically, these creates um, these creates constant values. Sunday equals a one, Monday equals a Sunday equals a zero, Monday equals a one, Tuesday equals a two, Wednesday equals a three, blah blah blah. You cannot change these values after you set them equal to to you initialize them in the beginning. So like if I said I said Sunday equal to zero, I can't set Sunday equal to one after that. So that's that's a good thing about this because it's good for readability. Now I just create an integer called today. Today we're gonna set it equal to Monday. Which is the value one. If today is Sunday or today is Saturday, we're going to print love the weekends. Otherwise, other otherwise, back to work. So it's going to do the same thing as last time, except we had so much more code writing because we didn't use an enumerated type. Yep, back to work. The reason why it says back to work is because today is equal to Monday. We set today equal to Monday. Today is equal to, and Monday is one. So that's because based on our the value that we set, constant value we set. So we said today equals equal to one. So because today isn't Saturday Sunday, it's not Sunday. It's not zero. Today one is not equal to zero. One uh one is also not equal to Saturday, which is six. Because we said today is equal to Monday, which is Monday is one, so today is equal to one. One is not equal to Sunday. Sunday, basically Sunday is zero, so one is not equal to zero. One is also not equal to Saturday. Saturday is six, so one is not equal to six. So that's why this doesn't get executed. This if statement doesn't get executed, then it just prints out back to work. That's what it does. Okay. Um. In summary, to today's lessons, we had all that crap. Um, we could do the exercises. I don't want to do the quiz. Oh, wait, what is the value? Oh, this is a good one. What is the value of blue? So, the, white is 0, black became 100, red should be 101, blue should be 102, green equals to 300. Which of these are good? bad or an invalid um i think you could do any of these this is just bad yeah i'm pretty sure you could do all of those what would happen what would be the correct variable type in which to store in your age um you should make it a float because that's a decimal value like your age you should you should be like be able to represent it like fractions and stuff like that decimals Area of a background, I think I would use a float also because the area could be a decimal. Number of stars in the galaxy, I think I would use an unsigned int because stars can't be negative, so that's why I made it unsigned. And then integer is just a number of values, a number of stars in the sky because it can't be a decimal. Average rainfall for the month of January, uh, maybe I would use a double because double uh, rain is a lot and you could have like decimal values for the num number of rain I guess I don't know um declare a constant for pi just do const um const double float for pi it would be just const double float equals 3.1 for whatever it was 159 159 Oh, no, not double float. Const float. Yeah. Uh, then uh, pi. My bad. Const float pi is equal to that. Yeah. 
Um, declare a float and initialize it using your Python. Oh yeah, you could easily just do that. Uh, random variable. Uh, variable, and then we just initialize it to pi. That works. Like this doesn't have to. Your float doesn't have to be a constant to initialize it to a constant value. Like when you set const, this value can't be changed. Like you can't set pi equal to like ten. But other values that are not const, you could set them equal to that. Because it's literally just this value. That's why. It's literally just 3.14159. So you could change float, like the random value, because there's no const to it. You could set it equal to pi. The reason you could do that is because pi is just 3.14159. But you can't change the value of pi because it's const. That's what it is. You can't. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Day four, three is done. Tomorrow, let's go to day four. See you guys later. Rate, comment, subscribe, and check you guys later. Peace.